Thanks so much, Anna and Lucas, for your introduction to the Digital Sherlock's program. Many online harms are meant to make us feel small or isolated and alone. And Digital Sherlock's began as a group focused on skills, like the geolocation challenge you just saw, but the group grew into a global community committed to the shared principles and shared set of facts. As Anna Pelle got to mention, this year's cohort included 571 people from over 90 countries since October. Now we turn to the infodemic corresponding to the COVID-19 pandemic. The term was coined by the World Health Organization last February, and it's defined as an overabundance of information, some accurate and some not, that leads to a situation in which it makes it harder for people to figure out what is actually going on. Unfortunately, infodemic is a challenge that grows exponentially over time. And we've seen an escalation of unverified narratives about COVID-19 worsen public health outcomes over the last year. The DFR Lab's Luisa Bandiera in Brazil and Tessa Knight in South Africa join us now to go in depth. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I am Luisa Bandeira, an associate editor with the DFR Lab. Hi, everybody. My name is Tessa Knight. I'm a research assistant with the DFR Lab. Today, we're going to be talking about weaponized, the COVID-19 narrative arms race. In the period directly following the emergence of COVID-19, facts about the virus and its origins were limited, or in the case of China, withheld from the public. This created the perfect opportunity for the spread of misleading information about the virus, now known as an infodemic. At the DFR lab, we saw all kinds of narratives about COVID being spread. But one that called our attention early on was that the claim that COVID was a bioweapon engineered either by China or the United States. The first article that we published about that was at the end of January 2020, and it showed how Russia was trying to blame the United States for the pandemic. At the time, that made us think back to Operation Infection, and we knew there was a history of health issues being used by state actors. So we decided to investigate if there was a trend and how different state actors were using information to pursue their geopolitical goals. The main question that we wanted to answer was, how are state actors using COVID-19 for their own geopolitical advantage? We decided to focus on four countries, Russia, China, the United States, and Iran. We investigated two specific theories, that the virus was a biological weapon, the theory we picked up on as the pandemic started to spread, and the theory that the virus was intentionally leaked from a lab in Wuhan, China. So how did we do it? First, we analyzed millions of tweets, posts, and articles that mentioned the origins of the virus. Then we created a database and include the mentions we thought were the most important. The first ones in different countries and languages, those that received a lot of engagement, and those that were spreading on different platforms. We ended up with a data set of 311 milestones from 26 different countries in nine languages that already pointed to some of the main trends in this discussion. Things like lab leak, Wuhan, depopulate, and Fort Detrick were keywords correlating to specific narratives that consistently cropped up in our research. So what was happening in each nation? As we said, the first country that mentioned the bioweapon theory in official state channels was Russia, and that was not a surprise to many people. So to give you an idea of how that was done, we saw that one person that claimed to be a specialist uh, called Igor Nikulin kept coming back to TV to make this claim. He appeared on TV in Russia 18 times. Still, there was a bit of a surprise, at least for me, that even though Russia has a long history of weaponizing information, in this case, their efforts did not appear as coordinated as in previous events, such as the downing of MH17 or the Skripal case. Instead, Russian state and adjacent media, they appear to publish this narrative in separate occasions without a lot of coordination. 
In that sense, the bioweapon story was not a dominant narrative about COVID in Russia. This graph shows mentions to COVID on social media and online outlets. In blue, we can see all mentions to COVID and yellow, the ones related to the bioweapon theory. So as you can see, the focus appeared to be more on other efforts that could benefit Russia geopolitically, such as sending Italy medical supplies at the beginning of the pandemic or targeting labs that received funding from the US and were located in former Soviet countries. Later, we saw that Russia recycled some claims that were coming from other countries, but it was not, again, a very sophisticated and coordinated strategy. So what was happening in the US at the same time? Well, COVID appeared to have been an inflection point for conspiracy communities in the community. Many of them were absorbed into the QAnon macro conspiracy, and this appeared to have played an important role in the spread of the narratives that China created COVID as a bioweapon. So the network graph on the screen shows a subset of some 400,000 tweets posted between January and April 2020. We can see in blue a cluster of supporters of QAnon and hyperpartisan right-wing influencers that had a strong influence in the spread of the bioweapon narrative in the US. Right-wing outlets with a history of spreading conspiracy theories, such as Zero Hedge and The Washington Times, were also instrumental in the spread. Later, Fox News played an important role in spreading the theory from fringe communities to a wider audience. As the bioweapon theory was refuted by scientists, it gave way to the theory that COVID was not necessarily a biological weapon, but rather that it had leaked from one of the labs in Wuhan. This theory was amplified by members of the US government, including former President Donald Trump, who claimed he had a high degree of confidence that the lab leak theory was in fact the real origin of the pandemic. From the time we published this report, until right now, any evidence that the virus was leaked from a lab in Wuhan is circumstantial. And most scientists still seem to believe that the virus was transmitted naturally. However, China has not been willing or able to provide information that will clarify lingering questions about possible roles the labs may have played in this lab leak theory. And this has resulted in US President Biden asking intelligence communities to shed some light onto the matter and dig into it further. Now, we don't have the time to discuss that here, but it certainly ex exposes an important challenge for researchers about how to deal with uncertainty when trying to assess the veracity of scientific claims. So moving on, now we have spoken about Russia accusing the US and the US accusing China. So how did China deal with that? Well, if Russia did not act according to their traditional disinformation playbook, China appeared to have bothered, bothered at least some chapters of it. So the first interesting thing that we saw when we started our research was that on Weibo, the first mention to the idea of COVID being engineered by humans appeared as early as December 31st, 2019. That was around the same time that the WHO learned about COVID. It shows how the theory first appeared organically and only later came to be used by state actors. But China was not focusing on accusing the US at the beginning of the pandemic. Instead, it was doing what China usually does in this space, controlling the domestic information environment while trying to project an image of efficiency abroad. That changed when people in the US started accusing China of causing the pandemic. Apparently, as a response to that, by the end of January, the first articles promoting the idea that COVID originated in the US appeared on Chinese state media. The high point in this exchange of accusations happened between March 12 and 13, when the foreign minister spokesperson Zhao Lijian used Twitter to claim that the US was the origin of the virus. To support his claims, Zhao used an article published by a Canadian website called Global Research Canada, as you can see in the screen. And this website is 
known for spreading conspiracy theories and Kremlin propaganda. But again, that shows how state actors try to use claims that originated in the West to make their point, as if they were trying to borrow the West's credibility. Well, China's claims, they got a lot of traction on Twitter. We looked for signs of inauthentic activity to see if it was coming from bots or fake accounts. And we even found some weird accounts, as you can see on the left. But our assessment was that the amplification was mostly authentic. Why? What China did was using diplomats and other diplomatic, diplomatic accounts to amplify their own version of the facts. Uh, these Twitter accounts were created before the emergency of the virus, um, but there, the pandemic appeared to be the first big opportunity to actually use the strategy known as the wolf warrior diplomacy. Finally, we'll look at Iran, which is the fourth country that we investigated. Iran came to the story a little bit later, maybe because it wasn't one of the first countries outside of China to really be hit badly by the pandemic. It primarily amplified claims that the United States had created the virus. One interesting finding was that Iranian state media relied on American anti-Semitic so-called specialists to push their claims against showing how the United States Sorry, again, showing how the United States' internal vulnerabilities are weaponized by other countries. There was some evidence of inauthentic activity in Iran, but mostly politicians and religious leaders served to amplify the bioweapon narrative. Finally, it was interesting to see that in Iran, the conspiracy narrative was seen in the way the government responded to the pandemic talking about a security threat rather than a health threat as the rest of the world was looking at it. To conclude this talk, we would like to emphasize three points. First, these narratives started with real people, not state actors, although we have looked at state actors now, which is interesting because it il illustrates that not all disinformation arrives from a top-down approach. Second, it was interesting to note Russia and China's engagement in these conversations. Unlike Russia, China moved to use more aggressive tactics, which we ought to monitor in order to ascertain if this is a new trend for the superpower or if it's a once-off. And finally, uh, the use of American vulnerabilities by state actors points to areas uh, where the US can also focus this information's effort. So uh, while it was important to, it is important to allocate resources to stop you for an intervention, maybe there's an important implication there, uh, meaning that it's also important to deal with domestic disinformation and conspiracy communities inside the country, because this is what making, it's one of the things that is making the US an easy target for foreign actors. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this conversation.